Hello, family, and welcome. We're Bob and Penny Lord, and we want to share a subject very close to our hearts today, grandparents, the grandparents of Jesus, Saints Anne and Joachim. Although there is nothing in Scripture about Saints Anne and Joachim, not even their names, the Church has honored them and given them a special feast day. Based on tradition, the early writings attributed to St. James and affirmed by the writings of Sister Mary Agreda in the City of God. St. Joachim was a rich man of advanced years who divided his blessings in three ways. The best was given to the temple, the next best was given to the poor, and the least he kept for himself and his wife Anne. However, upon offering his gift to the temple one year, he was chastised and told he should not be allowed to offer to the temple because he had not had any children. He was told to look in Scripture to see if any of the leaders of Israel who had given to the temple had not had children. He did so and could not find any who did not. In anguish, he went out into the desert, fasted and prayed for 40 days and 40 nights, pleading with the Lord for a child. He mentioned Abraham, who had given birth to Isaac at an extremely advanced age. At the same time, his wife Anne was also lamenting. Actually, she had two lamentations. One was for her impending widowhood, as her husband had gone and she did not know if he would ever return. The other was being barren, not being able to bear children. She prayed to the Lord. However, it appears she was able to strike a bargain with God which may be the reason everyone flocks to her for her intervention. She has the ear of the Lord. She was praying beneath a laurel bush when an angel appeared to her. He told her that she would conceive and bear a child. The angel's words were, Anne, the Lord has heard your prayer, and you shall conceive and bring forth, and your seed shall be spoken of in all the world. For her part, Anne committed her child to the Lord. She responded to the angel, as the Lord my God lives, if I bear either male or female, I will bring it as a gift to the Lord my God, and it shall minister to him in holy things all the days of its life. At the same time, the angel appeared to Joachim out in the desert and told him that Anna had conceived and that he should get back to Nazareth immediately to be with her. He ran back to Nazareth, bringing with him ten spotless lambs to offer to God and twelve tender calves for the priests. He met his wife at the gates of the city. She threw her arms around his neck and praised the Lord, for he had spared her from being a widow and childless. And conceived and bore a beautiful girl child whom she named Mary. In keeping with the commitment she had made to the Lord, Joachim and Anne consecrated the child to the temple when she was three years old. That child was to become Mary, the mother of God. St. Anne and St. Joachim were to become the grandparents of the Messiah. Although there is not much more told, nevertheless they were the instruments God used to bring the spotless vessel who would be the mother of God, who would bring peace, hope, and joy to the world. Tradition hints that St. Anne took part in the betrothal of Joseph and Mary, it was in the house of Anne, the house which today is the holy house of Loreto, that Mary received the announcement from the angel Gabriel that she would be the mother of God. When the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary, she was praying. Anne had kept her word to the Lord. She never forgot the promise she had made. She had consecrated this child to the temple because of his generous, miraculous gift to her. She had filled this child of her golden age with the traditions and hopes of her people, the coming of the Messiah. So although it was Mary who said yes to the angel, it was her mother Anne's teaching and grooming which prepared Mary to receive this messenger from God and say yes. How did Anne feel when Mary unfolded the happenings in Bethlehem? The shepherds who had followed the star to where the angels told them the king of the world was to be born. What were Anne's thoughts as Mary excitedly told her of the Magi and their reverence? And what were Anne's misgivings when she saw myrrh, the ointment of death, as one of the gifts? Or was she enjoying the gift of being a grandparent too much? 
and chose to shut all fear out of her heart, at least for this priceless moment. We believe that St. Anne was there to help her daughter, Our Lady, to take care of the precious grandchild in the early days. We don't know if St. Anne was with the Holy Family when they fled to Egypt, but it is believed that she was in Nazareth when they returned after the death of King Herod. Grandparents are the storytellers. As Grandma Anne related to her grandchild Jesus the stories of their people, the Jews, did her heart tremble as she realized that this young shoot of Jesse's tree would someday die for the salvation of the world? Did Simeon's words, he will be responsible for the rise and fall of many, trouble her as she saw him growing into manhood? Could she foresee his climb up the infamous steps that became holy because he walked upon them? Or had God in his infinite mercy spared her from this piercing wound, the crucifixion of her most precious grandchild? It is believed that our Lord Jesus and his mother Mary were at the deathbed of St. Anne. Jesus was a young man, possibly about 11 or 12 years old. St. Anne was most likely at the head of the procession of those in limbo, ushering the victorious Jesus into heaven after the resurrection. Jesus loved his mother. It only stands to reason that Jesus' perfect son was also perfect grandson, and being love itself, loved his grandmother. As love never dies, that love did not die. And you can see it in the faith of these hundreds of thousands of pilgrims who come to seek the intercession of St. Anne, Grandma, knowing he listens and cares. From as early as the sixth century, devotion to St. Anne has been very strong in our church. Shrines were dedicated to her by various popes down through the centuries. Pope Constantine probably initiated devotion to St. Anne in Rome in the 8th century. Pope St. Leo III presented a vestment to the Basilica of St. Mary Major, which was embroidered with the Annunciation and Saints Joachim and Anne on it. So much was St. Anne considered one of the strongest intercessors for the French that when they sailed to the New World, New France or Quebec, Canada, as they called it, Sailors always prayed to St. Anne to guide them through the treacherous waters of the North Atlantic, especially during the winter. The bulk of the settlers to New France came from the Normandy and Paris regions of France. The first chapel devoted to St. Anne was by the Jesuits in Acadia on Grand Breton Island in Nova Scotia in 1629. One of the most popular and powerful tributes to St. Anne in the world has been her shrine on the shores of the St. Lawrence River in the province of Quebec, Canada, called St. Anne de Beaupre. There is a tradition that sailors who had been saved from the vicious sea built a small chapel in honor of St. Anne in the area of Le Petit Cap. The written records show that in 1658, the first small church in honor of St. Anne was built on the shore of Le Petit Cap, as Beaupre was known at that time. Because it was built too close to the shore, it was victimized by the spring floods. The original owner of the land donated another parcel to the bishop, Father Inland, on which the second church, or what is called today the Memorial Church, was built. A great many miracles were attributed to the intercession of St. Anne at the church in Beaupre. In 1661, a statue of St. Anne was placed at the shrine for the first time. Over the years, our Lord Jesus, through his grandmother St. Anne, has provided the pilgrims to her shrine with many graces and blessing. It has become a major shrine, both in Canada and in North America. In 1872, the first basilica was built. It was completed in October of 1876. Five months before, in May 1876, Pope Pius IX declared St. Anne patroness of Quebec province. In 1922, the beautiful Basilica of St. Anne was reduced to ashes by a fire. The only thing which miraculously remained untouched was the statue of St. Anne, which had been on top of the building. The same statue has been placed on top of the new basilica, which was begun in 1923. It was finally dedicated and consecrated in 1976. 
Although this basilica is magnificent, it continues to be considered a work in progress. Hello, family, and welcome. We're at the Shrine of St. Anne de Beaupre in Quebec, Canada. We have with us Réjean Bernier from the Shrine, and he's going to share some beautiful insights about this most powerful shrine of Our Lady's Mother. You know, I have heard about this shrine from the time I was a little girl, which isn't that many years ago, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, never came. And oh, it's just like the way I feel about our faith. How many years I have missed, I have lost. I can't wait to come back. This is one of the sh beautiful shrines of Canada that I just do not want to leave. So come with us today as we um, pilgrimage, we journey in faith through the shrine of our Blessed Mother's mother and our dear Lord Jesus' grandmother, Saint Anne de Beaupre. And now we were going to turn this over to, he says, you can call him Reggie. Réjean. <laughs> oh, Reggie. <laughs> Tell us a little bit, Reggie, uh, Réjean or Reggie, about this most powerful shrine of our lady. How did it begin? You know? Well, you know, the reason why I speak a bit of French and I do speak in English, well, our ancestors are from France. And in France, they had a strong devotion to Saint Anne, and they still do. Praise God. So, uh, those people, when they came here and they established themselves on the coast of Beaupre, it was kind of natural for them to have a church here dedicated to St. Anne. So that's what they did. In 1658, they built the first church, a little chapel. And while they were building that church, there was a guy named Louis Guimont who had problem with his back. So as a symbolic gesture, he just said, well, I'm going to put a few stones into the foundation of that church. And by doing that, he got cured. Praise God. <laughs> so other people started to come, and also there was a, this is also an history about uh, people on the boat uh, having problems with their boat yeah. uh, close to a shipwreck. So they did recommend themselves to St. Anne. So there was already a church there, yes. and this, they came uh, the day after. They were saved. They got here on the shore, and they went to see the parish priest, who was all astonished to see all those people arriving like that, uh, saved from that shipwreck. That's good. So. I think it's very important to, to comprehend, to understand that this church that we see now today at the back is not a big church because it's a, an, an initiative of human beings. It's God who took the initiative to show His love in a particular way through healings, through favors obtained, but also to the experience that all those people coming here as pilgrims can experience in their heart. It's, you know, during summertime, it's very special to see all those people, handicapped people, uh, uh, sick people, who come here and they're smiling. Mm. Mm. And sometimes we meet people that they have everything to be happy, to smile. They have like two cars, two mm. houses, two <laughs> this and that. And you, we just look at their face and we don't see that happiness. Mm. They're not smiling. I would say that it's one of the uh, great, quote unquote, miracle here to see all those people suffering, but being here with others and with their faith uh, are smiling and they're not asking necessarily for a cure. This, they, they, most of the time it's for more courage, uh, hope, to continue their journey. There are people from Springfield Mass that, I, that I, I remember saying, well, he said he, he, was, he was on a motorized stretcher, he was uh, all oh, paralyzed. And yes. coming here during the Novena, just having a pillow to put under his chin, mm, mm. to be able to see the, the statue of St. Anne, mm. and he was saying, just to be here and to see the statue of St. Anne give me the strength uh, to keep on for another year. Until so, we can come back again. Yes, yes. <laughs> I love it. So these are a faith-filled people that yeah, come that's here. The, yeah, and I just want to quote about Marie de l'Incarnation, who just said how it began here, and I think it's going to resume how it began. And she was here at that time. Yeah. Yes, as early as 1665, seven years after the first church. Marie de l'Incarnation wrote a letter to her son, who was living in France, mm -hmm. because she was married before becoming a sister. So she wrote a letter to her son, and this uh, is what she wrote. Let's stop for a moment. 
uh, our, our audience does not know about her. Just tell them briefly about her. Well, you have to remember, we in the United States have a lot to learn too. It's true. Well, I forgot to. Yeah. Well, she's the foundress of the foundress of the Quebec Ursulines Convent, ah, yes. and she's a famous lady here in the development of the Quebec diocese. Oh. I, just a little quote that will uh, tell to the people that, I mean, the reputation of healings and all that didn't start yes. 50 years ago, didn't start 100 years ago. It starts since the real beginning. So I just want to quote, to take a, a quotation from her when she wrote a letter to her son in France. So she said, she wrote, Seven leagues from here is a hamlet called Petit Cap, where there is a church of St. Anne, in which our Lord does wonderful marvels in mm. favor of, of this Holy Mother of the Blessed, Blessed Virgin. And then she adds, There paralytic people can walk, the blind recover their sight, and the sick, whatever may be their mal malady, recover their health. So I think and it's this is over 300 years ago. Yes, in uh, September the 30th, uh, 1665. Okay, so this has been going on. There has been a great devotion to the mother of uh, Our Lady, Saint Anne, in the French tradition for centuries. And when they came here, they brought that tradition with them, and that's how the shrine here started, as uh, Blessed Marie de l'Incarnation had said. 300, over 300 years ago, healings were taking place here, and it, it hasn't stopped, it still goes on. You know, we have an expression uh, at Lourdes, and we say if only two or three percent of the French are going to church, they're all at Lourdes. And we hear that uh, there is, even in this blessed part of the world, that is so French still in tradition and heritage, and Catholic, there is a decline in uh, attending church. But I'll tell you, they've they're, got they're all, all here. be here. <laughs> <laughs> we met two ladies this morning from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This is their 13th time oh, yeah. at uh, St. Anne de Beaupre. She says, well, a year can't pass that I don't go to visit Our Lady and her mother here at, mm -hmm. at St. Anne de Beaupre. So it is, even for Americans, it, oh, is, a, yes. it is an important shrine. And it's so near to us, people. Yes. Just, uh, now, okay, so this is how the shrine began. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me, how did these things come about? Here we have, this is the church of the uh, Scala Santa, yeah, the Holy Stairs. Yeah. How did that come about, Rejean? Well, all those, like, the, uh, with years, because of people coming here, well, of course, they build a church, but they build also other places to help for devotions, like the Holy Stairs to... Uh, so people can remember and repeat and pray the same steps that Jesus climbed when he arrived in front of Pilate. So in, in that perspective that we, the Holy Stairs has been built, it's the little beautiful. chapel that we see behind mm -hmm. is a memorial chapel, a part of the third church, because the big basilica that uh, uh, we have now is the fifth church. Mm -hmm. So the previous churches, either they were too small or they burned. So the third one, we kept one part of it as a memorial chapel. Beautiful. Because after 200 years, it was too small for the amount of people coming <laughs> here. Now you also have a way of the cross, similar oh, yeah. to Lourdes. Oh, yes, I mean, it magnificent. Reminds me of that way of the cross that, you know, pilgrims, the one that we always show you, that video we have on, on the way of the cross at Lourdes, they have one in back. On We're the going to show you here, here, too. Which is very similar to one that we see in Lourdes. It is such a beautiful shrine. And each day during the summer, there's one preached daily in French, another one in English. And maybe one thing, uh, especially during the summertime, the quote-unquote the staff, yes. mm -hmm. uh, I prefer to say like pastoral workers, uh, we have a team of about 10 to 15 young people helping the Redemptorist Fathers right. to, to welcome the pilgrims for guided tours, to preach the Way of the Cross for rosaries, uh, time of adoration and all that. So it's kind of a partnership yes. uh, between the lay and also the Redemptorist Fathers who are in charge here since 1876, I think, as a community. Well, now, that, that's, pilgrim... that's the spirit of Vatican Council too, isn't it? Yes. We are living yes. that spirit. Now, when a pilgrim group would come here, is there anyone who would kind of help them to find their way around the shrine so well, that 
Yes, of course, there's the reception booth outside, but the more we know about a group coming here before, mm -hmm. well, we're going to try to make it personal as much as possible. Yeah, that's that's good. Good. Uh, and whatever, quote unquote, but whatever the pilgrims can ask, we'll, we'll try to, to give them what they need. I mean, mm -hmm. each group has their own particular need, right. uh, their own intentions. About they come in petition, and, right? Yes, or they'll come in Thanksgiving or whatever so the case So we try as much as we can to, to give what they want, but to help them more to make their pilgrimage meaningful. So mm -hmm. when they go back, I was just there to say that they'll be witness of uh, that a new faith uh, to God. And Saint Anne is very important, I think, to say. And of course, she's not another God. We have, of course, right there to say enough of one. Yeah. But uh, we pray with Saint Anne. We ask right. her to pray for us, as we could pray for one another and with one another. But as a good grandma, uh, wishing the best for. Her, her children, well, that's the same thing here. Good Saint Anne, welcoming everybody. And it's not like uh, sophisticated people, it's not a high class place, it's for everybody. Everybody yeah. are welcome here. It seems the, the atmosphere is very pleasant, very, it's very easy. You know, you, you don't feel like you're walking on eggs, you, you feel like you're at home. You yeah. really oh, do feel yes. like you're with relatives mm -hmm. when you're here. In, in all parts of, of Canada, you feel like that, but <laughs> most especially here. My grandson once said, that as much as our Lord listens to the prayers of a mother, so much more he listens to the prayers of a grandmother. <laughs> and I, in, in particular, and uh, we ask you too, at home, to pray before the beautiful statue of Saint Anne, so that you can ask her. You're on pilgrimage right there in your home right now. Some of you tell us that you'll never be able to come, and this is your pilgrimage experience. Pray to her. She will bring your petition right to the hands of her precious grandson, whose life she was involved in. Because our Blessed Mother, who was immaculately conceived, was conceived in the womb of Saint Anne. Now, Rajan, we're giving you an opportunity to speak to the people of America. Especially the youth of the America. The youth of America. What would you like to say to them? Well, sometimes we may think that a shrine or a church is only reserved for, excuse me, the expression, but senior gray citizens. hair, senior citizens, <laughs> gray hair people. Although it's okay. okay. <laughs> and I don't know if I'm right to say that, but yes, I think would. it's very important. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very important to, I mean, a pilgrim is someone who would like to take a time out of his TV set, mm -hmm. of his uh, Walkman, of the uh, business uh, of life, take a time away to know more, who am I? Where am I going? Where am I coming from? And when we look about all the teenagers and young adults, they don't know, I mean, it's not easy for us, I consider myself a young adult, it's not necessarily easy for us to know where we want to go what are the values of our life, uh, what, it's the me what is the meaning of our life. Mm -hmm. And we don't find that in a Walmart or... A, so For sure. when you just take a time in a shrine like St. Anne, or like any other shrine, well, when we dare, we dare to taste the silence, because it's not easy to get silence, to be comfortable with silence. We always have a Walkman, we have music in the elevator, music in the car, music... Television, uh, television on, on to keep you company. Yes, all the time. But there's a silence which is not an emptiness. It's more, well, where God there to, to speak to our heart. You're allowing Him to fill you. Yes, yeah, so we don't need to be strong believers to come at a shrine, to take a time away, to take a time of silence. I'm always surprised here and at the same time happy to see like what we call skinhead people here. An Iron Maiden t-shirt guy with a leather coat with pins on it crying in the footstep of the statue. Mm. What is going on there? That's Who right. knows? Something is happening. Something God. divine could be happening. You're here with your grandmother. <laughs> and That's it's right. always Grandma good. Ma. We have always been able to relate very often. We can't relate to our parents. We can't let loose with our parents, but we can always let loose with our grandmother. Not even your grandfather, but your grandmother. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> grandfather is good, too. You know, uh, it's, it's interesting that Bob says that some we as grandparents are the love department. Our parents are the ones who care for us, make sure that we're well fed, that there's a roof over our head, that we get the proper education and live in the right neighborhoods. 
but our grandparents, our strictly a love department. And that's what you discover here is grandmother, grandmama, or as we said in my people, nana, who is here waiting just to love you. And so we can tell her anything, we can be just children again, visiting grandma. One thing we'd like to mention is, you know, we, very often when people see our, our programs, they, they thank us because the places we bring them to are so far away that they would never be able to come. They're always overseas in Europe or in the Middle East or uh, in Poland or Ireland. This is a place that is only about two hours away by car from the United States. So it, it really is a close shrine. Uh, you really owe it to yourselves, as we did, finally, after all these years, <laughs> to come to Canada to these beautiful shrines that we've heard of so much but have never gone to. You do owe it to yourself to come and visit these beautiful shrines that our Lord has given us here in our own continent. You know, today, when so many of us are thirsting for the divine, where we feel an emptiness and a uh, a hollow part in our life. When Jean, uh, uh, when Rejean was talking about the meaning of life, we, as Brother Joseph says, we, we get to a period in our life, each one of us, where we seek the meaning of our life. In reality, we are seeking the divine. This is a good place to come, be silent, and hear your Lord talking to your heart through his mother and his grandmother. Leave your computers home, leave your Walkmans home, leave your Nintendos home. Come and be silent and be filled by our Lord Jesus through his mother and his grandmother and St. Joseph, who is the patron saint of Canada. Praise God. We praise you, Jesus. We thank you, Rejean, for this time you've given us. Mm. We thank you for having us here at the shrine. We look forward to many people from the United States coming to the Shrine as a result of this program. And we will be back. I hope so. <laughs> we will not forget. <laughs>